How did you get started as a photographer? Basically, my vision came into form back in 1969 when I was about nine years old, is when I started to, to develop a, an appreciation for photography. And it's through this book right here, Black and White America, that really opened me up to photography as a young child. My father had a, a signed copy of this book on our coffee table in the projects of Brooklyn. And as a young child, I would just go through these images here, and I was just blown away behind the gravity of each shot, you know, documenting the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, and poverty. And uh, I remember looking at this book, like, constantly to the point where I tore it apart because I was looking at it, like, every day. I was just compelled behind these images. So a few years later, my mother, she had um, an Instamatic camera all the time because she used to give a lot of parties and go out. So she had th this camera around the house, and I would see it, you know, just sitting there. So she gave me, I asked permission to utilize it, and she let me take it up to my school. And I started to, to record a lot of my friends back in uh, junior high school and high school. And a lot of the images here in this particular book, A Time of Four Crack, represent those very first images that I've captured of my friends back in junior high school and high school with that 110 camera. And what I learned about photography at that point was it was like magic to me. You know, it gave me a, a voice and a sense of purpose. You know, prior to having it, I had a little stuttering problem, and I, was, I, had a, a, I was a little unsure of myself, but it seems like when I got that little one, 110 Instamatic camera, and I looked through that viewfinder, I saw a whole new world, and it enabled me to say beautiful things to people. And uh, I saw it as magic, and my life has not been the same since. You know, it's, once again, it's given me a sense of purpose and identity. Uh, Gordon Parks did a book called A Choice of Weapons, and he discusses, to me, that book is dealing with his life coming up as a photographer and how he used the camera as a weapon to, uh, to enlighten people. When I came up, there was a lot of weapons on the table. There was a lot of guns, there was knives, and uh, I decided that the best weapon to me to help educate and inspire people would be the camera. So when I was at, 50, at the age of 15 years old, I got deep into my photography and I would carry my camera everywhere I went and I would just approach people and just tell them how special they were. So it just wasn't about taking pictures, but it was about making people feel good and saying, can I take a picture of you? And why you want my picture for? And, I, and that, that was what I always wanted to hear that because I could sit back and say, because you are beautiful, because you are special. And it, it just made me feel good to say things to make people feel good. So that's basically my beginning. How did you feel going to the publishing center? I was feeling kind of good because I knew what I had meant something. I really did. I strongly felt that these images had importance. And prior to me going to my publisher, I did work with The Source magazine and, uh, and with Trace magazine. And what was unique about The Source magazine back in 1998 when I did The, the 100 issue, it, they gave me about, I believe it was about maybe 17 pages. And the magazine sold out all over Brooklyn. It sold out. Everybody wanted it because, you know, we were so accustomed to seeing images of artists, rappers, and, and entertainers, but to see real people. It blew people away. People that, that actually were here during the birth of hip hop, it blew people away and the magazine sold out. So when I went to the publisher, Powerhouse, back in 2000, they had already heard about me and they actually told me they were looking for me. So I showed them some work and they told me your book will be out next year. And sure enough, it came out the following year. I was blown away. Because everything I read, that's not how it goes. You have to put a proposal together. You know, you have to, it's a lot of work into getting a book deal. And uh, I just went against the grain, and, and I just felt, I went with, with, with my feelings, you know, and I, I strongly felt that I had something that was important. I had to go against the grain, and they didn't deny it. And back in the days, it wanted to be a bestseller. It actually sold out, the first edition sold out in, in, in two months, and the, uh, that was 4,000. The second edition sold out in two weeks. So they knew it was a major book. How did graffiti affect your work back then? Wow, this is very interesting. I started off as a graffiti artist. My whole crew was basically graffiti artists. And I, 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 I dabbled into it in the beginning, but I wasn't really good at it. And I, I had a name, Comanche. You know what I mean? And as a graffiti artist, you don't get names like that. You know what I mean? You get names with basically two, two letters. Like most of my partners were AG, KO, uh, La Boy, but Comanche was just long. And I remember writing it. It took so long to write. It was like, it gotta be a better way. You know what I mean? So, you know, that was my humble beginnings. Like I said, all of my friends were graffiti artists at that time, and um, it was definitely played a role in my development and appreciation for art. 
because that was basically my first contact with art was graffiti back then. And um, I just re regret not photographing the trains back then because I thought they would be around forever. So I would see this, this great graffiti and it would just bypass me and then one day it was all gone. But um, graffiti today and my work goes basically hand in hand. You can't have one with another. What's crazy about graffiti with my book, I have people looking at my book and saying, man, you have my friend in your book. And I'm saying, really? He said, yeah, you, you got him. He's from the Bronx. I said, wait a minute. I don't remember taking that guy's picture. And they go to me and say, he's right there. I said, wait a minute. You got to be kidding me. That's your friend. And that's his cousin. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, it just it makes me feel good that, that I've touched people like that, that, that the photography is beyond an image. But, you know, it's just hand in hand, like this shot here. You know, they say, yeah, you got, you got my, my brothers there. I said, well, your brother is two, two girls. He said, that's my brother right in the background. So I feel really good that, that, that my work enabled me to capture certain elements of graffiti. Whereas a, a lot of times we see images of the, um, the outside of the train, but very few people shot the inside of the train. And that's, where, that's my relationship with it. So we go hand in hand, and I feel good that I preserved the history to that degree. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing. A lot of my good friends are graffiti artists, you know, who've encouraged me and who've taken me over to Europe. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, Sharp, Aaron Goodstone, uh, he helped create the Wild Style logo. And we did, we did our show together in Italy, you know, and in France. So we have a relationship. You know, the graffiti artists are like my cousins. We, 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 we went in the same in trying to take this urban art to the next level. Did anything from the streets affect your life or your photographs in any kind of way? So, so much, so much. I think that uh, what really impacted me was prostitution. I think that that really did it to me, you know, because I, I was in the military, you know, and I came home in 1980. I was 20 years old. And a few blocks from our house, maybe about 10 blocks, was a park called Lincoln Terrace Park. And it was so many prostitutes there. You know, I've never seen anything like that before. And it really did something to me. And um, I wanted to be a journalist, you know, when I was younger. You know, I, I got inspiration from a, a journalist by the name of Gil Noble. And he used to do stories on, on, on drug addiction and, and just social issues. So I started really, when I came home from the service, going out to Lincoln Terrace Park, confronting prostitutes and talking to them. And I was blown away how they opened up their door to me and they shared their, their, their stories with me. I'm 20 years old, but they talked to me about life and, and some of the bad decisions in which they've made. And I, I remember recording these conversations and then taking them to the local high school that I went to in Brooklyn, Tilden, and I would share these stories with some of the students there. And I think that experience kind of like caused me to be not only a photographer, but a, 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 a social activist where I wanted to use my photography to teach and inspire people. So rather than just take pictures of prostitutes, I had to get this story from them and take these stories and just pass them on. So that affected me greatly. And of course, violence affected me because what was going on in my community back in the 80s again, a lot of violence started to come into play. And I, I knew so many of these participants. I knew the killers and the victims. And it was so crazy that I didn't even realize this here because I got along with basically everybody. And I lived in an area in Brooklyn on, on Rimson Avenue. And we went oftentimes by, by streets. We had the 90s, and we had the 50s, and we had the 40s. And there was so much beef amongst everybody. And I lived in this neutral zone. And as a photographer and a person who liked to work out, you know, when I came home from the service, I used to train a lot. I used to always run, you know, in the morning, you know, and just keep myself physically fit. And I would connect with people as I was running. A lot of guys would start to know me and respect me. And I would bring people into my home and turn them on to music and teach them how to play chess. And I realized that there were so many enemies to one another. On the block that I lived, it was this guy, Carol. Carol's dead now, too. Carol was a great person to me. He was a wonderful brother. And I really dug this dude. And he, lived on, he, he used to be in the corner of my block all the time. This is Carl right here. He was a young man, about 19 years old. And he was a general. He's a strong warrior brother. And um, me and Carol used to talk all the time. And it's funny, we would talk at night. And during the daytime, I, I would have his enemies at my house. This is another crew from another area who I connected with. I was tight with them. They would come to my house, and we were tight with each other. And I would find out later on that Carol didn't shoot them because he respected me. 
So he would give them that pass, and I would feel the tension, not realizing that these guys were enemies to each other, but out of respect for me, they, didn't have, they, they let the beef subside. And that really blew me away right there. So I started to really use my camera to talk to these guys about, you know, stopping the violence. And, you know, let's, let's not do this here because I knew so many people. Like I said, I have pictures of killers and victims in my book. You look at these images and it's all smiles, but there's so many enemies in this book of each other. I mean, they look like they might may be tight. And you look at two crews and you might think that, you know, these guys are one and the same, which I thought, not knowing they had beef with one another. And it took for these books to come out to really help me realize this, you know, the seriousness of that time. And um, I just wanted to just try to end it. Because I, I heard stories oftentimes that as I was taking pictures downtown Brooklyn, like an example like this, it would be another crew across the street ready to move on these guys. But out of respect for me, they wouldn't do it. You know, so that inspired me to just want to do more. My prison experience inspired me to do more. When I worked on Rikers Island, I would work maybe 16 hours a day and I would see so many people incarcerated and it bothered me. And in my mind I said, I got to go out in the street and do more, I got to save these kids. And I would go out to the streets and, and just talk about the fact that I was a correction officer and try to encourage people, look, you don't need to go to jail. The only way to go to jail is as a correction officer. So all these things really inspired me. You know, the prison, prostitution, violence, crack, everything that was going on inspired me. And, and, and I, I got to add too. When I saw that crack epidemic coming and my friends start to fall because of crack, I had to go back out there and teach again and I had to try to encourage young people, look, I, that this dark cloud of crack is coming, you guys got to get off drugs, you know what I mean? You got to clean yourself out, think about the future, because I saw it was coming. So, so social circumstances gave me the vision and determination to go out there in the street and do what it was I was doing. All these things had me get out there because people listened to me. For whatever reason, people respected me. And when I started to share knowledge with individuals, they opened up and, and they were very warm towards me. If you were not a photographer, do you think your personality would have been different? Oh, definitely. Photography, you have to be humble. Oh, I think about like sometimes, like, how did I do this? You have to have humility because you want that picture. You have to approach a person. And somebody can sit back and say, man, get the F out of my face. So you have to be willing to take that. You know what I mean? You take abuse. And everyone is not willing to do that. See, my images are very different. And they've been critiqued because people are posing. But to me, the pose is getting a person's permission. It's letting a person know. That, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's not a confrontation. I'm approaching them, and it's a sense of approval. So, you know, it taught me a lot of humility to be really humble and be patient with people. You got to be patient and understand it. And uh, it takes a lot. You know, I was asked a question in an interview the other day, can I still do it? It's a different time today. You know, it's, it's really different. And I still have it in me to approach people, but I'm not as motivated as I was back then. Because it just took a whole lot out of me to approach people. Because I'm constantly approaching people. And I was very fortunate. The majority of people agreed. But it might be that one person might just curse you out. You know, get out of my face. And that, that, that could kind of like do things. But I, I just kept moving. You know, I, I had a desire to record this history. And I think that I did pretty well in, in, in approaching people. Like I said, I've, I've had moments in my life, but I've gotten past them to record the, the history. And now people approach me and say, now I see what you were saying. Now it means the world to me what you did. And that, that touches my heart. What is the difference between approaching people back then and today? Oh, man, today, yo, this, this is so different today. See, back in the days, we, had, uh, we didn't have cable television. We didn't have cell phones. You know, uh, you know, before these pictures, we didn't have crack. You know, and we didn't have a lot of the violence that we see today. It was just a more peaceful time. You know, you had beef. You know, individuals didn't, in fact, have conflict. But it was just a time when, you know, there still was a lot of peace out there. I mean, back in the days, we used the greeting of peace all the time. You know, peace, how you doing? You know, we referred to each other as brothers. You know, we referred to the women as sisters, as queens. It was different. You know what I mean? What I hear now is, you know, bitches and hoes and dogs and niggas and punks. Oh, my God. You, 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 you break down a person as a human when you say things like that. If a woman is nothing but a bitch, you know what I mean? You know, how could you, how can I photograph a person who's called bitch? When your know, guy approaches you and tries to talk to you and you don't respond the way he wants you to respond, now you're a bitch. So it makes you hard now. So if, as a photographer, if I approach you 
in this day and time and say, can I take your picture? You know, everybody, they're not trying to hear that. Plus, today, everybody got a camera. And now they put it on the internet. You know, and, and, and that was funny, too. And I saw the, 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 the transition back when the cell phones came out and with the internet because you had people that did really immature things. Because now they take a picture of a person, cut off a head, put it on a naked body, put it on the internet. So in the 90s, I would start to confront people about taking their picture. Like, you know, can I take a picture of you? No, you can't take my picture. I, I don't want the internet. So it's just start to change, you know, drastically because people did such foolish things and everybody had a camera. Today, everybody got a camera. The majority of people who have a cell phone got a camera and a cell phone. So it's different now because it, 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 it's just out there more. Back in the old days, I was one of the few people with a camera, especially a 35 millimeter. Everybody didn't have a camera back then. That's why they called me Picture Man. When they called me Picture Man, I was the only Picture Man out there. There wasn't a bunch of us, I was Picture Man. You know, so it's just a different time and crap made everybody hard. It's like when crack cocaine came out, people's hearts became hardened. No one's, uh, uh, everyone was suspicious of everybody now. What are you gonna do with my picture? Are you police? You know what I mean? So it changed everything drastically, you know? It's just, and it's so different now. It's a lot of hatred out there now. See, back in the old days too, you know, we had gangs back in the 1970s. And the gangs faded away with the movie Roots coming out. And then people started, like I said, to respect and honor one another. But once uh, Crack Cocaine came out, and the movie Scarface came out, and the Uzi was introduced, the 9 millimeter, everything just changed. You know, President Reagan at that time, he cut a lot of social programs, so poverty w was, was very prevalent. And it was just different. People didn't have time to take a picture no more. You know what I mean? They just, everyone was suspicious of everybody. So it's, it's definitely a difference today than it was back then. And I, I, I miss those days a lot. Because, you know, it was a lot of peace. Now it's like, it's a lot of beef. Everyone is hard. You're not going to get smiles from people no more. It's all about looking hard today. It's all about being a thug. Back then, it was about being righteous. You know what I mean? When you really strove to conduct yourself in a certain way, women were respectful and dignified. You know, women have been reduced to objects, and men have been reduced to thugs. And that's the difference. It wasn't like that back then. You know, you had, you know, we had, like I said, it was about being righteous, being respected. Today, people feel you respect because you got a body. You respect because you came home from prison. Women feel good now because they got a, you know, a big behind. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's so twisted now, you know, how women have been reduced. I'm satin behind it personally. I feel sorry for women today because it's just different. We really, was, we had a lot of respect for women back in the days. So it's just a different time period. When you were taking these photographs, were you thinking about recording a moment in time or were you just trying to educate? It was, it, was, it was twofold. I wanted, I was telling those that I photographed that this is history. And once I took the picture, I always said, this is, this is history. You made history now. Now it's sealed. It's timeless now. So I was doing both. I was recording history, you know, and I would say to them also, my subjects, that this is something your children will be able to see later on in life. And I feel so good it's come to pass. But I was also trying to educate them at the same time, which is more important to me. It was definitely more important to talk to them about life than it was to take the picture. The pictures, to me, represent a visual diary of my life. When you look at these books, it's beyond pictures. It's a visual diary. That's why I'm calling my next book Seconds of My Life, because these images represent seconds of my life. I could look at this book and remember the day like it was yesterday. I remember these days so well. So it's, it's just a recording of my life and the people that, the people that I met, because it got to a point I was meeting so many people, I had to record it. And you look at all these pictures, I say, damn, I met all these people. I've been in these different places, and I feel good that I have these memories. Because it's very interesting, when I was in the service, I was stationed in Germany, and just like it's cold outside today, it used to be cold like that all the time. And I'd be in the woods on a post, on guard duty, and it'd be miserable. And I would have many of these, these pictures on me. I would take them to the field with me, and I would look at them because I would get homesick. And I always said to myself, I don't want to ever be left with pictures. It's these memories that really gave me the fortitude to survive the misery of being in the military. So I never wanted to be without images. That's why when I came home, I went to take pictures all the time because I always wanted to have a record of my life. And I've actually achieved that. And then like I said, secondary, it was about, the, 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 or should I say the main objective was to really talk to kids, to talk to people about life. I had to. I was that big brother that whatever reason people respected. You know, a, a young lady who wrote a story about me, she described me as like an uncle image. But I felt good to take on that role and responsibility. Because one thing about it, when I came home from the service, I went back to my local high school. And I went to the, to, the, to the cousin's school of my high school. 
Tilden and Erasmus. During the morning, I go to Tilden High School and take pictures. And during the afternoon, uh, 2 o'clock, I shoot Erasmus. And I just developed this bond with these kids. I, I didn't want them to make the same mistakes that I made. So I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old. And I was able to take the test for the military and move on and change my life, get my GED, go to college and everything. But I didn't want them to make the same pitfalls that I've made. So I was trying to use my personal experience to help guide and educate people. And they all listened to me. Whatever reason, smoking was a big thing back then. And I was trying to get people off that because I hated that cigarette. You know, my father smoked. And I, was, I, I worked so hard to at least get them to stop smoking. And, and, and I, I was successful in that. And I, I was in the help. You know, I was a vegetarian. I was encouraging vegetarianism amongst young people. And everyone was open, you know. I was into jazz music and some serious R&B, and I was sharing that with them. I was teaching kids how to play chess. So I, I always walked with a camera and a chess set. So and I felt good that in between photo shoots, we would sit in the park and drink some orange juice, uh, eat some bananas, and play chess. So I was trying to give them all of what I had. And in, in the same time, they were giving me things. They were keeping me attuned with what was going on out there in the streets. You said your father never liked that kind of photography. So what did he think after you accomplished something? He never liked He still didn't like it. He, he looked at them as, what did he call them? Uh, hoods. Hoods. I ain't taking pictures of hoods for him. Hoods. <laughs> I show him a stack of pictures, right? I come home, I'm more happy, you know what I mean? I got my pictures out the shop. I give it to him, and he just look at them, garbage. I'm like, damn. Damn, this guy's rough. You know what I mean? He just looked at it as garbage. He just didn't see the value in it. You know, deep down inside, he, he you know, because he, he was a fine arts photographer. He did, he did photography in the Navy. And, you know, he wasn't really feeling it. You know, he just didn't see the value of shooting these people. I mean, I got one shot in here that he actually liked, and he, he complimented me on it. But other than that, psh, he looked at it in disgust. I said, this guy is deep right here. But, but he, he gave me the vision. You know, he would, he would give me objects to shoot. You know, and, and like I said, that body of work I'm going to introduce in my next book, you know, in terms of what he showed me to shoot. And he, he, he helped me to look at things on, on, on another level. Not that I ever discounted this, because I could have easily stood back and say, you know what, he doesn't like it, I'm going to shoot something else. But I kept, I kept shooting this right here. And uh, unfortunately, he, 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 he died, and he wasn't able to see uh, my books published. You know, so he never really got a chance to really see it. But it was this shot that he really appreciated. This picture's actually in color. The color one is bad. And when I took this one, he gave me a thumbs up. He said, OK, he, he's getting it now. Because this is a result of him teaching me uh, the shutter speed, light and speed. So not only was I just taking just shots, as he would call them snapshots, this is technique, and a technique that he showed me. So, um, but I learned from him. I, I definitely gained the wealth of knowledge, and I understood what he was saying. And I felt really uh, honored that he was my teacher, because he taught me basically light, composition, and how to develop. You know, so those two stayed with me. And when I look at that work now, that I was like, wow, I got some deep stuff here. You know, that, that he, he would really be proud of me if he had a chance to see where I have, how I have evolved. I know a lot of photographers take pictures of famous people. Why weren't you attracted to that? You know, because famous people, you guys are famous, you know what I mean? I'd rather get people before they become famous, you know what I mean? Why get them when they're famous, you know what I mean? I'd rather get young people when they're just young and they have goals and aspirations. So everybody went after the famous people, even to this day. I can't shoot famous people. I've been given jobs. It's like, I don't really want to do that. I have partners that do that, you know what I mean? They, they, they into that. Because, you know, the, 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 it's funny, the couple of so-called famous people I shot, it's like attitudes with them. I'll never forget, I went for this one photo shoot, and this guy, a famous, a famous artist, he just kept me waiting. And he got off on just keeping me waiting. And I said, I don't believe this guy because he's famous. He thinks he could treat me this way here. So it just really turned me off with this individual. I'd rather go for the, for the regular people. And then they, some of them, become, a lot of them become famous. There's so many famous people in this book here. You guys ever heard of the rapper AZ? Sure. I got a picture of AZ when he was 12 years old. And he went on to be famous. You know what I mean? And a lot of these guys, this is AZ as a, as a kid, a 12-year-old kid. 12 years old. And he went on to be famous. I mean, so there's a whole bunch of fam famous people. I have college professors in this book here. Um, so many different people. There's a lot of success stories. So I, I, I didn't go for the fame. And to this day, I don't like the fame. I don't like the red carpet. I stay away from it. I like the streets. I mean, I'm not really into that whole famous thing. Not to take anything from them, but I like regular people, real people. When you were young, did you have a particular target audience? Basically, back then it was just young people. It was, it was black and Latino people, because that was the culture in which I came from. That's the community in which I came from. So that was a community that received me well. 
so mainly black and Latino, and basically people my age and younger at that time. I was, what, 20 years old? So I focused on people 20, from 15 to maybe uh, 20 years old, you know, my age and, and, and younger. That was my audience, but mainly young people. Like, like, like I indicated before, people that represent like my little brothers and sisters, I went after them. Because most people, all of my subjects now are basically, all these guys you see in these pictures are basically 40 years old now. So they were about maybe five years younger than me, the majority. So that was my target. And it was, it was a mix between male and female. There was a balance. I shot just as many females as I shot males. You know? And I tried to shoot as many Latinos as I shot blacks. I tried to keep the flow going, a pretty good balance. If you would go back in the 80s or the 70s, what would you achieve that you didn't? If I can go back in the 70s now, I'll warn people about crack. They probably think I'm crazy. I said, man, I, I, that's, that's an interesting, well, that'd be a great movie too, Back to the Future, and go back in time and just tell people that, look, crack is coming out. You guys gotta prepare for it. I wish that I could just tell people that, they, you know, they have warned people of, of this day, because these times are not good. These times are, I mean, this, this is, I never remember a time in history where life is like this here. I mean, for your generation, and the thought that some of the males might have to go to war. The fact that some of your friends will go to Iraq and die, come back, some might come back wounded. Your generation. Back in the days, my generation was seeing Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam War ended in 1975. I was 15 years old. You know, so your generation is having to deal with a lot. We had heroin back in the 70s. Your generation now has everything. Oh my God, crystal meth. Crystal, I can't imagine crystal meth in our community. You know, we didn't have the 40 ounce of beer. We didn't have the crack. We didn't have all these drugs. We didn't have this violence. You know, we only had basic few TV, a, a few TV stations. You know what I mean? You guys got cable. You know what I mean? You, you got, it's so much that's out there now, the video games. Back in the days, chess was a game that people aspired to play. Now y'all got all these high tech video games. There's so much now. Like I said, the cell phones, you know what I mean? We, 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 we didn't have all these things. So to go back in the time, I wish it was possible to go back and just let people know what's going on out here. Sit back and say, look, you guys got to prepare. Because not only do we got to deal with AIDS, we got to deal with AIDS. I mean, excuse me, not only do we have to deal with crack, we got to deal with AIDS. We didn't have that back then. Imagine that. That's why I had to call the book A Time Before Crack, to let people know there was a different time, to let your generation know there was a different time. Imagine, imagine me growing up as a teenager and there's no such thing as crack and AIDS. Could you believe that? That is crazy now that I experienced that. A time when love was a message. I mean, look at these album covers. There's not one song on here that deals with profanity. None of these albums say parental guidance. This is one of the greatest albums that came out of the 70s and went into the 80s. Love is the message. Isn't this something? Love is the message. Now you hear some of these songs today. Look at this. Family Reunion. And some of the songs in the series, Unity, Family Reunion, You and Me, She's Only a Woman, Living for the Weekend, Stay Away to Heaven, I Love Music. This is an artist that really inspired me and helped me understand my purpose in life, Marvin Gaye. This is one of the greatest albums besides Love is a Message that dealt with the time. And this album is so relevant to what's going on today. What's going on? If you guys are familiar with that song, What's Going On? Yeah. Very, very important and so relevant. What's Happening, Brother, is a deep song about a, 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 his brother, Marvin Gaye's brother, coming home from the war in Vietnam. So we had men coming home from Vietnam. Uh, save the children. I love this song. You know what I mean? Save the children. God is love. Mercy, mercy me. You know what I mean? But you listen to the songs now. It's like violent. You're talking about bling and your car. And your, you know what I mean? How many women you got? How many women you got? Women in different area codes. Think about that. <laughs> Look at the change. We didn't have that back then. We had a purpose. You know what I mean? The music was inspiring. The music was, was food for the, for the soul to me. I call it soul music, you know what I mean? Because it was inspiring. Now you listen to a lot of music, there's a lot of anger in it. And not to take anything away from the artists because many times they are speaking about their experiences and the things they've seen. And so many people are now traumatized. So many individuals from this generation are experiencing pain and suffering like never before. Back in the days when I was coming up, if you had a person that was incarcerated, it was, it was a rarity. Today, everybody knows someone in jail. Everybody knows someone that died. We didn't have that back then. We just didn't. You know what I mean? And everybody here, let me just ask you, out of a show of hands, how many of you guys know someone that was murdered? Okay. I was in Philadelphia and I asked that question. Everybody raised their hand. 
Everybody raised their hand. Then I, I posed another question. How many of you guys had a person in your family who was murdered? And everybody raised their hand. I'm like, oh my God. So this is a different, and we're not talking about war. You know, so we live in a very serious day and time, and as a photographer, I have a, I have a responsibility, not only to take pictures, but I have to use my pictures to, to teach and to educate and to share knowledge. You know what I mean? Every picture tells a story. This is a very interesting shot I took while I was working in the prison. And this is of a young, of a young prisoner, of a young female who's in car. And she's a blood. You know, she's a prisoner and she's a blood. And I shot this to show a part of my life that was seeing a lot of young women coming to prison now, like never before. And never before in history, women are now one of the uh, uh, biggest recipients of prison now. So I try to use my pictures to tell stories and, and educate people. And I talk about this shot. And I talk about this young lady. I don't remember her name. I do remember that she came home, but she was a blood. And her attitude is she is a blood for life. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a picture I, I, I use to teach also. And I call this particular shot, when two worlds meet. When two worlds meet, you have the rich and the poor. And I actually shot, like 15 people walk by this woman. So I have 15 different shots of people walking by. It's going to be in my next book. But I'm trying to use my pictures to just tell tell stories of, of, of different situations that are going on in life. You know, every picture tells a unique story. This is a very interesting shot that I took back in the 90s, you know, and I call this image At Loss. At Loss. Two young children next to a picture of Tupac and, and with, with some of his words to his song. So, you know, like I said, I have a responsibility to try to really educate people on, on things that are going on out, going on out here. This is a, a picture that means a lot to me. I took it to the Million Man March, and I call this love, just love, something we don't see anymore. See, your generation is, is growing up in, with Maury Povich, Jerry Springer, you know what I mean? Where you're not really seeing the love no more. You know what I mean? You have, you have people that get on national TV, a young woman, and she doesn't know who the baby father is. And that bothers me because you know, it's shown all over the world, these images here. And I have to combat that as a photographer because everyone isn't like that. Everyone just isn't like that. What does the world think when they look at images like that? When you are on national TV and you swear this is a baby's father, you get up there, well, he has your head and he has your knees. You know what I mean? I'm 10,000% I'm, I'm sure you are not the father. I mean, yeah, but that's seen around the world. So as a visual artist, I have to combat that. And everything I do within my power, I'm trying to combat that by showing reality and showing love, you know what I mean? And showing responsibility, you know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's my objective as a photographer, to show love amongst different cultures, you know what I mean? To show it, because it does exist. And we see it every day. But oftentimes the media doesn't show it. They show the ugly side, but I know that there's a beautiful side out there. So this is what I'm about, you know, trying to just pass the baton on to your generation, because I love y'all so much. You know what I mean, y'all are like, once again, it's like, back in the days, it's like, y'all like my little brothers. Now it's like, damn, y'all like my grandchildren. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not really. But I'm just trying to share the knowledge for your generation to have in hopes that I can make a difference. Do you think, because today we have a lot of stuff, it causes negativity? No, it's not that it causes negativity. It causes you, the generation, to be distracted. Because it's like you have the computer and you can see around the world, but now look at some of the stuff that's on the computer. Look at the things that you are seeing. You know what I mean? And that's not a bad thing because, I mean, the computer has, to me, let me know how bad things are. I had no idea that things are as bad as they are until I started getting my computer like that. Things are really bad. But the computer allows you to travel around the world and, and see the world and, and explore. But it's, it could be a distraction also. The cell phone is like a distraction. Back in the days, we didn't have cell phone. We relied on, look, I'll meet you at such and such a place, and we just didn't like that. Or you, you, you go get on the phone for 10 cents. Now you, you're on your cell phone. I, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, you know, but sometimes it's a distraction, and, and, and this generation has a lot. We didn't have a lot back then. We had one pair of sneakers that we wore for about at least six months, at least six months. One pair of sneakers that cost about $25, $30, and we treasure those sneakers. That's why you had a toothbrush, you kept them clean, you changed the shoelaces to make them look good every chance you got. This generation now, and that's $25.
You know what I mean? Your styles are changing constantly. I remember back in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I tried to be down with the sneakers. It's like, I'll get a pair of sneakers, and next week they had a style again. And people look at me like, damn, you got them old played out sneakers? It's like, damn, I gotta go play catch up and get the next pair. And those are out of style too. I'm like, you know what, forget this. I'm just gonna be me. Because the styles are constantly changing, and you know what I mean? It's just a different thing. You know what I mean? But your generation's a strong, intelligent generation, generation but it's also a generation that's been wounded and, 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 and is being desensitized. Generations being desensitized. There's a lot of violence out there now. And you're constantly seeing the violence. It makes you desensitized, even if it's on TV. You know, you, wow, you saw how he got blasted? You saw how he blew his head off? You got the video games where guys are just chopping heads off? It desensitizes you where it's nothing to kill a person no more. There's no remorse no more. And it's starting to affect people psychologically, these games. You know what I mean? Violence, is, 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 it's just getting bad now. There's, there was a thing I was watching on TV the other night, how this girl, 13 years old, was beat up by these three girls, 14. They beat her down. And it's on YouTube. Now you can watch it. They had the other one where you had the parents allowing the kids to fight each other. And the parents are cheering it on. So these things are being encouraged now with this technology. You know, your generation has to make a difference. You know what I mean? Your, your generation has to stand up and challenge some of these things because it's not really good what I'm saying. It hurts me. I was in the store, the bookstore today, and I'm listening to this. I'm in there looking at some books, and this song is on. I don't know who did it, but I'm in there, and I'm listening to this song, and every other word is nigga, 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 and it's tearing me up inside. And now your generation has been desensitized from that word. I haven't. I was, when I was in the military, we had the Ku Klux Klan. And they used to always write, death to niggas. And that, that word meant something to me, you know what I mean? And today, in this day and time, the generation says, this generation says, well, it's a different word. But people from my generation, it stabs me every time I hear it. I'm in a bookstore. I could be at a clothing store, because now all the stores play music. And every time I hear that word, it just tears me apart and it's breaking me down inside as a man. And I become so depressed when I hear that word, so depressed and miserable. It's like I gotta go out to the ocean and detoxify from that poison because it's tearing me down. It bothers me. That word is such a negative, negative word. I hate that word. Did you ever see yourself as a role model? I have to be, I have to be. Role model is a really strong word, and a lot of people stay away, away, away from that word, but I have to be. I have to be an example to young people. Definitely, I got to. It is so important to me that I try to set an example to young people because, you know, we need that in our lives. We need as much as we can to help strengthen us in our, in our journey in life. So I take on that responsibility, and I try to be correct in what I do. And I have my faults, and I ask God every day Forgive me for anything I've done wrong. Please forgive me. I beg you. I have, it's, it's so deep that these last few months, I'm really trying to further define my purpose. And I'm trying to make amends with some of the bad things I've done in my life because I'm not no angel. You know what I mean? I, I, I've, I haven't made good decisions in my life. And I'm trying to just come, come, come in terms. And I really feel by, by giving my life to young people that I, I, I'm, I'm making amends for some of the things I've done that maybe weren't too correct. But I strive now to be an example to young people to the best of my ability. I still have my followers and I'm still learning, but I have to. I have to be a torch light. I have to be an elder to bring you guys on because I'm a veteran now. I'm a vet. I've been down for a while. So the nods I got on this path of life, you know what I mean? You guys are about to enter that path. And if I can help guide you and shine that flashlight to, to, to make your journey a little bit easier, I have to do that. It is so important to me that, that I'm here for young people. My life and death is all for you guys. You know, so if I can encourage people in photography, if I can encourage people to be more compassionate, more understanding, I've done my job to a great degree. If I could generate money to send kids to college, I'm going to do it. If I could put myself in a position where I could have conversations with millionaires and say to them, look, you know what I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want your autograph. I need you to sign a few checks for a few million dollars for me so I can send a whole bunch of kids to college. That's what I got to do. So I'm trying to be a voice right now to try to do, to do my part and help as many people out as I can. And uh, once again, these books have enabled me to have a greater voice. And hopefully I can meet people and start to talk to them. Working with Russell Simmons has been a great thing for me because he has given me the opportunity to go into the school systems to share my vision and to donate my artwork to raise money to help kids who are disadvantaged. So I strive to be a role model. And I, and I, and I say to everyone here, strive to be a role model. To your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, your neighbors, please do that. Take time with them because they need it. 
It's hard out here to do this by yourself. It's really difficult. We need all the help that we can to make this thing happen. You know what I mean? And, and neighbors need it. All of us need it. And be kind to each other. The only thing I say to you, be kind to one another. You know, we tear each other apart. You know, we make each other feel ugly and stupid and dumb. You know, let's say good things to one another. You know, so we all have the power to bring about change. And you plant a seed, you grow a flower. Before I came in today, this young man rolled up on me. It made me feel so good. I have to write about it. You know, um, I was leaving a barbershop, and he saw me. He says, I know you. You know, I know you. I said, okay, here we go. Here comes the story. Let me just give him a couple dollars and just keep it moving. And he says, I know you from Rikers Island. I said, okay. And I asked him, one of the first things I asked him, was you in my house? Because I had a steady house there. He says, I wasn't in your house, but my friend was in, in your house, and he always used to tell me how good of a person you was. I used to always watch you, and I admired you. And I just wanted to just come by and just acknowledge you. And that made me feel so good. And I just didn't accept it for that. I had to talk to him more to make sure that he was all right. But it made me feel that I did my job. And he says, you was a role model for us. You was an example. And if only we would have listened more to you, we may, we, we, we may not have, it, there's a good chance that we might have not have been in the situation that we were in today. And that made me feel good. So I strive to, you know. I, I have this belief that you never know when the person is watching you. So always strive to be correct, you know. And I, my philosophy is always plant seeds. I try to always give to the poor and to the needy. And there's a side of me that I miss jail, working in jail, because when I was in jail, I was trying to really enlighten people, educate people. I would bring extra clothes, because I worked with the mentally ill, which is which, which was a, a great opportunity for me, too. I worked with them for 10 years, and, and, and I, I helped them. A lot of my coworkers laughed at them, you know what I mean, made mockery of them. But I looked at mentally ill people as very special individuals, and they, they probably caught hell all their lives, from the time they were born until the time they were put in that jail cell. And I wanted to make their lives easier. So I used to just bring them cologne and give them cologne and clothes and have, get them a sense of pride in themselves. And I, I miss that a lot. I feel that my calling is still in jail because there's so many good people that are in jail. I watch so many young people want to kill themselves. I had a young man in jail that wanted to hang himself. And he was going to hang himself. He was going. And when I sat in the cell and talked to him about why he wanted to kill himself, he told me that my mother's boyfriend raped me gave me AIDS, and when I told her, she threw me out the house. He says, I have nothing to live for. I'm like, oh my God. Whew. That was a hell of a story. That was a hell of a story to hear. So, you know, I was there to try to help people. I mean, I talked to him, not, I, I, I was able to convince him that, 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 that he shouldn't kill us. So I don't know what he did later on in life, but being in jail five days a week put me in a position to really help a whole lot of people. I met so many good people who got locked up for things that weren't right. Good people, people like yourself, you know, you get into a, a dispute. You might mistake an identity. Now you locked up in a jail cell and you want somebody to hear you out. CO, CO, I'm in here for something I didn't do. Well, somebody listen to me. I said, Let me go talk to this guy. What's your name? My name is so and so. I don't belong here. Can you help me out? And I would help kids out. And to this day, I walked down the street and I heard people come to me and say, I remember you. You got me a lawyer. You know, you gave me a sandwich. You let me use a bathroom in private. You gave me a book to read. I'm like, wow, I did my job. So I miss being in that jail because people in jail, everyone in jail is not a criminal. There's people in jail that need help. They need direction. A lot of good people came from prison. And I felt that by being in there, I could save lives. And it's something I've been retired now four years, and um, I feel like I need to do more. I have so much life in me right now. I got so much more work to do. So I need you guys to help me do the work and try to make a difference. But once again, I have to say I love all of y'all very much. And we don't say that enough to each other. You know what I mean? We just don't. You know, but I mean that. You know, you guys are very special to me, everybody here. And I'm so honored to be here to talk to you guys. And, and, and hopefully, you know, this conversation might mean something later on in life. And I hope that it does.